welcome to our fifth spring workshop of on archaeology at work. I'm Christine Hastorf, the director of the archaeological research facility at the University of California, Berkeley, from where this is coming today. And it's an umbrella research unit on the UC Berkeley campus that oversees all things research in archaeology. But clearly, research has many different um, aspects and domains. And today, we're really fortunate to be having this workshop on one very important aspect, which is um, uh, cultural research management. So uh, to start off, I'd like to uh, give an acknowledgement and then I'll turn it over to um, our moderator. So we acknowledge that the University of California, Berkeley is on unceded traditional Yichin land. We respect the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout many generations. We honor their elders, both past and present. I would like now to welcome you all to today's event and especially thank the panelists for taking time to speak to us about their work, jobs, and lives. Our moderator for today's event is Dr. Albert Gonzalez. Dr. Gonzalez is an assistant professor of anthropology at California State University East Bay, right next door to us in Hayward, California, where he has taught since 2015. He also directs the C.E. Smith Museum of Anthropology and the Pacific Earthen Architecture Research Laboratory, also at that institution. So he is a very busy man. He also trains students in decolonization of museum and laboratory methods in that research uh, laboratory, and I assume the museum too, as they relate to the interpretation of indigenous and Latinx documents and material culture. He is a colleague uh, he and a colleague recently won a CSU East Bay Outstanding Contribution to Community Engagement Award. So we all should congratulate him when we um, thank everybody. So congratulations. Well done, Albert. Dr. Gonzalez has been a good friend and colleague of ARF and seemed to be the perfect person to moderate this panel today. So we're really grateful, Albert, for you taking the time and your very busy schedule to help us. Um, very much, thank you. Uh, I would like now to turn over the screen, uh, the, the stage, the setting to Albert, who will um, begin our uh, exceptional panel of professional archeologists who are now going to talk about their work uh, within resource, uh, cultural research uh, management. So without further ado, Albert, please um, start our session, which goes on for two hours. Thanks so much, Christine, and thank you, uh, Sarah and Nico, um, all three of you for inviting me to do this. It is a great honor. Um, I, uh, I have been uh, attendant, uh, at, in attendance at ARF uh, events for so long now. Um, it's just wonderful to, I'm sad that I can't be there in person. I feel like I'm saying this for um, every uh, uh, talk and panel I'm a part of um, these days, because it would be great to be um, up there, up front in the, in the very room um, would be wonderful. But uh, um, it is an honor to, to be invited to, to moderate by people I admire so, and an institute uh, that I admire so. Uh, the ARF has, has really been an invaluable uh, resource uh, for me, um, as for, for as for so many others, but uh, it's not an exaggeration to say that it's uh, guided and shaped the course of my career and is, a, is an important part of the reason why I'm still in Northern California um, and haven't gone somewhere else. Um, it's really important to me. Um, my past ARF attendance, uh, you know, talks, it was like a, uh, as, a, as a grad student, a visiting researcher, uh, most of those, uh, I was like a kid in a candy store, really. I don't think there was a single talk where I didn't uh, fully immerse myself, invest myself, ask questions, and then, uh, you know, bother the speakers, um, harass the speakers afterwards. Um, and I think CRM presentations and panels are especially important uh, in the ARF's uh, repertoire for emerging archaeologists, since the vast bulk of us are either CRM archaeologists or have been uh, CRM archaeologists or will be uh, CRM uh, archaeologists. So to the students uh, present, uh, grad students and undergrads, I say uh, if we were in a if we were in a you know room in real life, I would say look around the room, but take a look at the names and faces uh, on your screen. Some of them frozen, some of them just big red letters. Um, whatever the case, this is the the future of uh, of California archaeology. Um, I wasn't sure I, I appreciated that or understood it when I was uh, um, in the audience. Um, as a graduate student uh, in the ARF. And the future of California's past 
is truly, uh, uh, in, believe it or not, in the hands, I think increasingly, of uh, CRM archaeology. Um, as academic archaeology uh, contracts a bit, recedes a bit for, for various reasons, uh, CRM firms increasingly shape historical narratives. And that, I'm not sure that's something that um, even many CRM folks uh, you know, uh, see very directly, but uh, it's CR all of us do CRM, you know, at some, most of us do CRM at some point or another, and we all play some role in shaping these narratives. CRM plays a huge role in, in guiding that uh, process. And uh, there's no better folks, I think, and, I, and again, this, is, this also is not an exaggeration, I promise you. I know most of these folks um, on this panel um, and have worked with uh, several of them in the past quite directly. Um, there's no one better to steer that ship than the, than the people um, on this panel, the excellent people on this panel. Um, some of you know that I'm a, a California CRM, uh, I think the word is fanboy or stan. Um, I'm an exceedingly avid fan of uh, California CRM I and mean, California CRM history and the stories uh, behind them. And uh, if, there were if there were CRM trading cards, I would collect them. And the people uh, in this bunch would be in special plastic sleeves um, guarded carefully. Um, they are that good, I think. Um, excellent folks. Um, and I'm, again, I'm so honored to be uh, moderating this, uh, this conversation. Um, so uh, the, the speakers got uh, uh, an email from us some, uh, a little while back uh, um, specifying the order in which you'll do your uh, kind of micro presentations. And I'll let you introduce yourselves. Um, they're going to introduce themselves, uh, do some short uh, presentations, um, and then uh, I'm going to ask them some questions afterwards uh, that they'll, uh, um, that, that hopefully hopefully are of some utility to the students um, and other folks and, and faculty also uh, present. And then we'll break out into breakout rooms, each breakout room with uh, one of the speakers and uh, students and other folks present should feel free to, to join the speakers um, in their own respective breakout rooms, whoever it is that, you, that you'd like to uh, uh, communicate with uh, in lieu of the, uh, the typical cookies in the, in the foyer. Um, and uh, it sounds like we got, a, we got a promise that next time there will be wine. So, <laughs> so, so next time, next time. Um, so I'll, I'll start things off then with, or, or I'll allow uh, Hannah Ballard to, to start things off Pacific Legacy uh, with her introduction and, and talk. Great, thank you, Dr. Gonzalez. I, um, my name is Hannah Ballard. I uh, work for Pacific Legacy. Um, I have worked for Pacific Legacy for almost uh, 25 years. It's really been the bulk of my uh, career in CRM and I recently, uh, became the CEO of the company as we transition towards a new generation of leadership. So these are exciting changes for our company. Um, and I know we're not alone in these sorts of changes that are happening throughout the uh, CRM world here in California. Um, so Pacific Legacy is a small cultural resources management firm. We have offices in California and Hawaii. Um, we have two offices in California, one right here in Berkeley and the other one outside of Sacramento in a town called El Dorado Hills. Um, and we have a, an office on, in Kailua on the island of Oahu in Hawaii. So we do work um, in California and Nevada and all over the Pacific. Um, we have permanent staff uh, that includes archeologists and ethnographers um, who specialize in Native American and historic period resources. And we also do some built environment uh, because some of our historical archeologists have experience with architectural history as well. Um, we also have uh, some in-house special analyses that we do, uh, starch grain analysis and obsidian hydration. So we, we provide those analyses, do it on our own projects and we provide them also um, as something we'll do for other companies. Um, we specialize in compliance with uh, state and federal cultural resources regulation as do most everybody here. Um, we look at, uh, do work around uh, the National Environmental Policy Act, the National Historic Preservation Act and uh, the local state uh, regs of the California Environmental Quality Act. Um, our clients range from private companies, uh, developers in the city of San Francisco to um, pseudo private companies like PG&E, uh, we work with local governments, cities and counties, state agencies like Caltrans, federal agencies like FEMA, National Park Service, Forest Service, Bureau of Reclamation. Um, and as I said, we do this work all over uh, California, Nevada, Hawaii, and the Pacific. So um, one of the things that, that we were asked to speak about were current issues in CRM. Um, I, um, one of the main ones that I think is, is really uh, coming up more and more is sort of the archaeology of disasters. In fact, in the 
the uh, uh, recent SCA, Society for California Archaeology meetings, there was a whole um, session on disasters and it has to do with uh, climate change related disasters and a lot of those are around fire. Um, and so we as a company, and I know a lot of the other folks here also are doing work after fires, after the major fires in California to, to um, help protect the resources that were burned or might, might have been damaged by the fire um, processes or uh, firefighting. And um, also working a lot with pre-fire prevention efforts, like working with PG&E to do surveys and cleanups and, um, um, and also sea level rise, which is Mike Newland's area's specialty. Um, but this area of climate related natural disasters is really a growing field for us. Um, and um, I think it's in many ways the, the future of CRM. Um, and I'm gonna maybe leave it at that, that because I know that other people have other things to say on that, <laughs> on the current issues. Um, uh, as far as the effects of the, the new administration, um, there, the, there's a lot that's going to happen and we don't yet, I think, know the full effects of, of what you know, the Biden administration is gonna do, but certainly uh, rolling back a lot of, of a lot of the Trump era executive orders around um, environmental issues um, should change the way land use is done and the kinds of work that we will do. Um, and really one of the biggest ones is changes in the department leadership, uh, particularly with the um, confirmation of Deb Holland to the Department of Interior, uh, which is really exciting to have the first Native American woman leading that department that oversees all of the federal lands. And so uh, again, we don't know exactly what that's gonna mean in terms of how uh, cultural resources management will be conducted, but um, there definitely is going to be a shift in for, away from you know, the fossil focus on extraction to multi-use um, and, and I'm sure also um, bringing in more Native American voices in how the land is used and treatment of sites, uh, more of an emphasis on that. Um, upcoming opportunities in CRM and for Pacific Legacy. Um, one of the things that, that we're really experiencing right now, honestly, there's a real labor shortage. So, you know, we're all having trouble finding crews. Um, and so um, I think there are a lot of opportunities uh, in CRM in general, in the, certainly in the next year. Uh, we have a lot of survey and monitoring projects that are going right now and will be coming up. Um, and, and also just recently got a big Caltrans on call that um, will provide us with a lot of other field projects. Um, so there's, there's some exciting things that are gonna be happening in this coming year. And the field season has kicked off in a big way. Sometimes it's more delayed in the year, but things are really rolling right now. So um, it's exciting and we're definitely looking for people to help us with that. Um, so we're always looking for responsible crew and people who have en are enthusiastic, have some experience, willing to learn, willing to jump in and uh, work with us. Um, so I guess that's the end of my mini presentation. So thank you. <laughs> I hope I left some room for some other, other things. <laughs> Hey, thank you, Hannah. And uh, I, I can see that labor shortage real, real easily um, because uh, so many students didn't receive field training in the last year. So there's a pool that, that doesn't exist right now that otherwise uh, kind of would have. Um, so thank you. Uh, and I think next is uh, Evan Tudor Elliott, Paleo West. Hi. Uh, thanks, Dr. Gonzalez. Um, I guess I'd like to uh, start out with just kind of saying that. Um, you know, I was where the, you know, these students were, I was sitting in the ARF, um, you know, many years ago as a young person, um, going to presentations, uh, you know, just kind of seeing what people were doing. And honestly, at the time, I didn't see a lot of uh, CRM. Um, I, you know, I didn't see that, uh, really represented a lot at the ARF at the time. And uh, it's great that it is, uh, it's more now. Um, I ended up really becoming aware of uh, CRM as a practice um, through Pat Kirch, who's uh, emeritus now, but you know, he, his specialty was the Pacific. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, may surprise people is that, you know, all those little Pacific islands, all those territories, um, you know, that the U.S. has, as well as, 
various military bases and things. I mean, those are all subject to federal, uh, you know, cultural resources management laws. So, you know, I ended up learning about it from there and, um, you know, getting introduced to folks with Pacific Legacy through that originally. Uh, you know, and I'd also just like to say before really diving in, um, you know, they're, you know, like Dr. Gonzalez said, a lot of great people on this panel. Um, I mean, personally, I have learned so much from, um, from Mike Newland, who come up later, and from um, and from Hannah as well, uh, having worked under both of them. Um, not only are they, you know, great archaeologists, uh, you know, good CRM people, but I also wanted to say that they are good managers, and they are, you know, people who are not. Uh, you know, are not going to take advantage of you as a uh, as a young archaeologist, as a young uh, employee. So, um, you know, I'm not saying that uh, that Desiree or Addy or anyone uh, is going to do that. Um, you know, they're good companies as well. But my own personal experience is that I I know these folks, and uh, you know, I can't speak highly enough of them. Um, you know, so to re reiterate, I'm uh, you know Evan Tudor Elliott. Um, I, I work for Paleo West. We are the uh, we are the largest terrestrial only CRM firm, um, which is a funny caveat, but just that uh, the company search is giant, but they do a tremendous amount of underwater archaeology as well. Um, and so we are we are coast to coast, uh, headquartered in um, Phoenix, and we have now. Five offices in California, um, three in Southern California, um, as well as uh, one in the Bay Area in Walnut Creek and one here in Sacramento. Um, you know, we also have offices in New Mexico, uh, Utah, Colorado, Texas, Florida. Um, and I think that's one thing that people should remember when they are, you know, looking into these you know, looking into going into this uh, field is that, you know, specialization can help you, but also generalization can help you and being willing to work anywhere is, um, is, is huge. And, you know, being willing to, you know, being able to say yes to projects um, is huge. Um, also, I want to apologize if I seem a little disjointed. I am on paternity leave and have a, a Seven week old, so I'm not getting as much sleep as even uh, as even undergraduate students do. So um, yeah, uh, so you know, Paleo West, you know, like like everyone here, you know, we are specialized in you know in compliance archaeology, state and federal regulations. Um, you know, depending on what what those are in the various states, um, you know, it's so important to get uh, get a grounding in that as much as you can, um, and you know, there are free things that you can use for that. Um, the uh, Advisory Council for Preservation has on the seminar and things. Um, and so, you know, we we work for a lot of the same sort of clients that, um, that uh, uh, Pacific Legacy does, you know, state and local governments, utilities, um, uh, federal, <laughs> federal agencies, private developers. Um, you know, we do a lot of work with uh, building in San Francisco, as well as, you know, out here in the Sacramento Valley, we are doing a lot of work uh, on water with, um, you know, Army Corps of Engineers. Um, further, further afield, lots of, lots of stuff from BLM, which in this case is Bureau of Land Management, not Black Lives Matter. Um, and uh, forest service, you know, lots of things like that. Uh, one of the things that we really try to uh, do within our practice is we focus a lot on um, digital methods of, of work, digital recordation. Um, we try to do, we do a lot of uh, photogrammetry, uh, you know, which, which is, you know, using computers and photographs to create 3D models, um, you know, when I started years ago, it was like, oh, buy this ten, you know, this hundred thousand dollar laser system to do scans. Now it's, you get this uh, two hundred dollar camera and 
uh, some computer equipment and we'll do an even better uh, 3D model for you. Um, so, you know, we, you know, we're really trying to, we really try to leverage that to, um, to make it so that we can spend more of our time doing, you know, doing the analysis, doing the, uh, the writing, doing, um, you know, doing the science than just, um, than just doing the recording, just transcribing, uh, transcribing field notes. You know, I spent way too much time when I was younger transcribing Mike Newland's uh, chicken scratch uh, and wasting that time. And I'm sure that if he could be typing that up on an iPad instead, it would, you know, everything would go more smoothly. Um, let's see. Um, so, yeah, um, current issues in CRM. I mean, I think, you know, I think, I think digital heritage has really become um, something that's really important. You know, we are more and more, more, more and more clients um, and more and more local agencies are really requiring various sorts of public interpretation as part of their, their mitigation uh, strategies. And so, you know, using digital methods to tell stories about the past and really get those stories out to a wide uh, segment of people, you know, the people who aren't going to be, um, you know, going to the library and looking at archaeology journals or, um, you know, seeking these sort of things out, but, you know, putting, putting interpretation in the lobbies of buildings that people can, you know, look at on their phones. And, um, I mean, on our website, we've got links to, uh, you know, these 3D, you know, 3D models that we do of uh, artifacts and things. Um, you know, one of the really rewarding things that we've done recently and you know we're also we also have architectural history as one of the uh, uh, aspects that we we offer uh, in addition to archaeology and anthropology um, and we did a um, we did a big recording effort and interpretation effort in uh, Montgomery um, civil rights uh, national historic district and you know just being able to tie places with um, you know things and people having you know clips of speeches along with um, you know what the building looked like 60 years ago and what uh, what it looks like now. I mean those things are, are, are really rewarding. And we're doing more of that in uh, San Francisco as well. The city there is requiring a lot more of this uh, interpretation. Um, you know, and I think you know branching off that, I think. Uh, really thinking about comprehensive uh, CRM, comprehensive heritage management is really important uh, these days. Um, you know, before anyone's time here uh, on this panel, uh, you know, CRM was archaeology, pretty much only. You know, you know, there was some architectural history that went on um, from other folks, but, um, but really being able to now seeing that that these things aren't, you know, shouldn't be thought of as separate when it comes to, you know, managing our, our past, managing our heritage, uh, you know, the architectural history, the, you know, the tribal outreach, um, you know, working with a series of tribes along a transmission line, just figuring out what the important places are for them. And, you know, working for a state agency, we have the, there we have the uh, ability to really give them things that they find are important and really sort of emphasize the places that they find sacred and important. And, you know, that's something that's always been, that's, you know, been in the laws for a long time. Um, it's been codified a bit more formally in California recently, but I think every year uh, all of us find that to be a more important part of what we're doing. Um, so, you know, when I was at Berkeley, I, Pretty much only took archaeology classes. You know, I didn't take um, I didn't take an ethnography class, um, you know, an ethnographic methods class. And I would say that is, you know, one of my regrets for sure. You know, I pick up things along the way, but being able to have the training to, you know, talk to people respectfully, listen respectfully, you know, take notes while you're participating with them. I mean, those are those are hard skills and they're uh, super important. And if you can, you know, you can show that you can do that, um, you know, that's definitely a way to 
advance in your career uh, more quickly than uh, some people might. Um, you know, going along with the digital recording, um, you know, there's, you know, my entire career really, there's been a crisis of curation. And, you know, we don't, you may not think about it uh, when you're thinking about, you know, these cool excavations and things that, you know, we, we do, but all that stuff has to go someplace and how to dispose of it, how to store it, um, how to decide what things are important is, is, is really more and more, um, you know, it's become more and more of an issue as, as these storage facilities uh, fill up and being able to do, you know, digital recording and 3D modeling that not only helps it so that we can, you know, return things to the ground or to the tribe or, you know, to teaching collections or other places. Um, it also allows us to let our colleagues, you know, see these things um, that they may not if they had to run off into a, uh, into a collections facility someplace. Um, see, you know, the new administration, I think that that's, you know, what, uh, what Hannah said about Deb Holland is, you know, super important. Um, and I, in the last six months, I've been on probably 10 or 12 meetings with uh, tribal representatives and every single one of them has mentioned uh, her and how much, I mean, even her, just her nomination went to, uh, went to tribal folks. Um, and so that could really, it's gonna be really interesting to see. I mean, it could be a whole new, whole new chapter in um, tribal involvement in, um, you know, and how a lot of these things work out in CRM. Um, and, you know, and I also think that, you know, a big thing is that a lot of the, you know, the Trump administration had been as much as possible exempting um, things from, uh, from environmental laws. And I don't think that that's going to happen as much. Um, so I, I, you know, I think those are, you know, positive things. Um, you know, as for upcoming opportunities uh, for us, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm seven weeks out of date on exactly what our, our needs are. So uh, I can't uh, say that exactly, but like, like Hannah said, there's a, there's a crunch for people. There is a, you know, we, we all need um, folks. We need, we need experienced people, um, which, you know, you may not be, but um, the, uh, we also need people who are, who are not experienced, who we can, you know, help foster and grow so that we can, you know, move experienced people around to the projects that like absolutely require those uh, folks. Um, and, you know, saying yes to things and saying, uh, you know, what else can I help you with is just tremendous when it comes to employees, much more important than, um, you know, how straight you can uh, walk a transect or, you know, whether you can read a, a GPS unit or a compass. I mean, those are things we can teach you. Um, attitude is not generally something that we have time to teach you. Um, so, yeah, just, uh, you know, being, being proactive and uh, helpful is, you know, just enormous. And like the, the, the employees who I've had who have just done so well are the ones who are like, you know, I can do that. Hey, I don't know how to do that, but I'd love to learn. Um, and, you know, hey, I'm done with this thing. Tell me what else I can do. Um, you know, as well as being able to take you know criticism because we're going to tell you when you we're going to tell you how you do things wrong and how you need to improve those um and yeah so those are, that's you know uh you know really really huge there um probably talk too long but uh yeah thank you thank you and i i, I truly appreciate what you what you're saying about taking notes uh, and I'm glad that you said that and that so many of my students are present um, because it's the, it's the hardest thing in the world to say, yes, just please, when you go take notes, because the first question is like, well, why? You know, like I, I have a brain, I can keep it all, you know, <laughs> right in here. And I, I, I tell all my students that I find it hard to trust uh, people that I work with who don't take notes um, because I don't know what's gonna happen afterwards. So thank you. Yeah, uh, and uh, uh, just to add to that uh, and add, asking questions, if you show up and you don't ask any questions, how do I know you're engaged in this project? Right, right. And thank you.
Um, and uh, next is uh, uh, Desiree Martinez. Thank you. So thank you for the invitation. My name is Desiree Martinez and I am president of Costco and Resource Management. And I'm coming from New Ontongo land, which you can see in my virtual background. And the Tongva are the original people of the Los Angeles Basin, as well as parts of Orange County, which where our Cogstone headquarters are. And I'm actually Gabriel and Tongva myself. Um, and Cogstone has five offices throughout the state of California. And we just celebrated our first year for our office in Arizona. And although we do a majority of our work in California, we have a number of projects throughout the United States and we're continuing to grow. Uh, Cogstone is a small woman owned business. And so, um, with that designation, uh, we're able to participate in a lot of federal work that's specifically geared toward women-owned companies. And we actually have some projects that are going to be starting in New Mexico, Utah, and Texas in the summer. So if you're interested in doing some traveling, let me know. Um, one of the big things that uh, Cogstone does besides archaeology is also paleontology and architectural history and history in general. But one of the big things we, we like to do is um, or not like to do, but what we do is really try to instill the use of an indigenous archaeology pedagogy. And what indigenous archaeology is, is the practice of archaeology for, with, and by indigenous people. And when you're doing CRM work, particularly because you are creating or researching or reviewing projects in order to be in compliance with laws, a lot of that anthropological inquiry that you're usually taught in the discipline Kind of gets kicked to the wayside and you cut and paste backgrounds and you cut and paste ethnographies and really that does a disservice to the ancestors whose history when you're doing archaeology that you're trying to explain so we always make sure that when we do outreach to native communities it's not something just to be checked off the box but you're actually listening to the indigenous population you're listening to them about the sites that are there and why the site is important to them, whether it's a sacred site or whether it's just a quote unquote milling stuff. Um, there's a big difference um, from how native people look at items versus how the law looks at them. So just because it's just a grinding stone and it's not significant under the law, it's significant to the native people that you're working with. And you have to accept that and you have to make sure that that comes out that you know it may be not significant and thus you can blow it away for the indigenous community whose resources like this are being destroyed every single day, that that's an important thing that needs to be protected. And as a cultural resource manager professional, you should try to um, make sure that the client that you're working for understands that and create recommendations in which their indigenous perspective and beliefs are protected. And so we try to instill that in our employees. And um, just as Evan said, a lot of um, what is being taught currently um, in the archaeological programs does not include how to talk to Native people. One of the things that I did when I was researching for my dissertation is, is um, recording, and, and I talk a lot about this to the, um, we used, I used to run an archaeological field school out on Catalina Island, and one of the things I would always tell the students is that Native people have a particular way of communicating. Just because they speak English doesn't mean that you are actually hearing what they're saying and what uh, some of the non-verbal uh, cues um, that you may not know can hinder your communication with Native people. And that's something that archaeologists aren't taught about. So it's becoming really important, just exactly what Evan said. There's a lot of changes in both the California law as well as at the federal law of how um, outreach to Native communities should be conducted. And to have that background and understanding of the Native communities that you're working with before you actually start uh, to work with them is very important. Um, and that includes you know, understanding their history, but not only from the books that are written by non-Native people, but by listening to lectures, by listening and reading uh, um, webinars, podcasts. My own community has put together websites with UCLA, Mapping Indigenous LA, in order to describe how we feel about particular sites around Southern California, being able to quote those sites and those books that the Native communities have actually completed themselves in your CRM report is very important. Instead of everybody quoting Clover or Heiser from 1978, that's all outdated, misunderstanding, misconstruing information about Indigenous communities. So that's one of the biggest things that I'm always a proponent of um, when I'm talking to up and coming people who are thinking about CRM is, is know on whose land you are on. 
and make sure you know it from their perspective and make sure that um, when you're looking at artifacts or looking at sites, that the site is not just a random dot on the landscape, it's connected to the, to the larger um, other sites that may be um, uh, not too far for them. Archaeologists like to put circles and dots around things and think that things that um, think that those areas that have nothing on the surface aren't part of the village or aren't part of the resource use area of that community. That's a backwards way of thinking about it. So if you're really wanting to do right by the client you're working for, as well as the community on whose land you are, you're going to make sure that you're going to document that whole use of that landscape, whether there's something on that land or not. Um, one of the biggest um, things that I think this current administration is going to impact um, CRM is I actually just um, released with Avacord, which is one of our partners, a statement on how excited we are for um, Deb Holland's uh, appointment as secretary. And it's really going to hopefully help um, extend that Native American consultation. And I like to use collaboration because no project should start even begin to be thought about without indigenous people who's on whose land that project is going to be on and what's important is making sure that um you know any work that's being done that it's not extracting native knowledge for the benefit of somebody else but making sure that we can also then help the community in some way whether it's through a mitigation measure of creating a book, which is one of the one, a mitigation measure that I suggested for an, um, to take care of an impact on a project, um, creating a cookbook on native foods that was used by, so that can be used by their community so they can come back to their traditional foods. You know, just really thinking outside of the box and making sure um, that the projects that we do are not maligning the communities or further damaging them. Um, and of course, with indigenous archaeological perspective, it's not just about indigenous archaeology um, or um, indigenous communities, it's about all communities that are on that land or have seen or used that site. So it might be the Chinese uh, American community or the African American community, all community members should be involved in the process and the work that we do at all times. And having those skills um, of, you know, learning them as an undergrad and continuing as a graduate student as you go on learning those skills to talk to people and to really listen and to understand how they communicate is going to be a, a very important skill for any people that I know I hire. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Desiree. Thank you for touching on uh, communication and in particular the law. Uh, I'm not sure that, that, you know, everyone sees the, you know, the wave that's on its way, you know, and not only at the federal level, but um, uh, at the state level with uh, recent legislation, AB 275, uh, Assembly Member Ramos' bill, um, I think things are gonna change a big way, um, in, in a big way in California. And I'm not sure everyone sees it coming in terms of uh, indigenous consultation um, across the board. So, and, and, I, and I hope that it does. So um, thank you so much. Uh, next is uh, Michael Newland, uh, ESA. Hi guys, and I'm gonna set my timer because I'm a rambler here. So let me know. Oh, oh, maybe I won't. Okay, um, I'm gonna watch the clock about that. Well, uh, so hi, I'm Mike Newland. Um, I'm director for Northern California Cultural Resources Group for uh, Environmental Science Associates. We have uh, boy, offices all over California, um, Washington and Oregon and uh, a satellite office out in the Southeast. I have been lucky enough to work with a lot of the people that are on this panel in one way or another, either you know, professionally on the job or went to school with them or uh, served in the Society for California Archaeology boards with them. I'm a, I wear a lot of hats. I'm a former president for the Society for California Archaeology. I, uh, I, f I founded the uh, uh, Climate Change and, and California Archaeology Committee uh, I, I sit as a co-chairperson. Like Hanna mentioned earlier, I've been doing climate change work since about 2012. Um, <clears throat> I also sit on my organization's uh, diversity, inclusion, and, and equity. Uh, <clears throat> we have a, a, like an internship panel, which will, this looks like Albert's got some great questions about internships later on. It'll be looking really for, great excuse for us to talk about that. It's a big issue for me. 
prior to this job, I was at uh, the Anthropological Study Center at Sonoma State University for about 20 years. And I trained graduate students how to run projects. And so some of the folks on this panel went through the internship program that I taught there. Um, and so uh, student training, student building student careers, cultural resources management, th these are all really important issues to me that I've spent really almost 30 years uh, working on. Um, everything that the panel has said so far has been spot on. Uh, I just really appreciate everybody's comments. I especially want to talk, uh, uh, touch on um, Desiree's uh, comments about working with the tribes. You know, a year and a half or two years ago, uh, I was, you know, doing a lot of archaeology and project review, and I was doing tribal consultation part of the time. Tribal consultation is now my full time job. It has, it permeates everything. It permeates the biology work that we do. It's involved in site design and hydrology and habitat restoration. Uh, all of a sudden, so I, I work for a, an organization that has biologists and environmental hydrologists and community development people. And really for the first time, they are all coming to me saying, we have this big tribal consultation component to this. Um, and really the agencies and the other departments, they don't know anything about how to do that. Uh, and in fact, I think uh, that what Desiree said about about the ability to speak to tribal communities, how to interact with tribal elders. Um, you know, a tribal chairperson, they're the president of their of their tribe, um, the equivalent, they're their leader. Most of us will never meet a president or the leader of a sovereign nation. And uh, there are uh, ways that you address uh, folks of that stature that most of us don't know. When you meet a dreamer or a religious uh, leader within an uh, organization, I mean, you're talking to the, they're essentially their Dalai Lama, right? Most of us are never going to meet the Dalai Lama. So uh, it re does require a, a, a different skill set than what we are totally normally taught in archaeology. So much so, and we, we could talk about this later, that uh, I've started to look for folks to help me out specifically with the tribal consultation. And I am specific, specifically looking for uh, tribal youth, uh, folks who are Native American coming out of a Native American studies background or you know, potentially an anthropology program who has experience and an, an understanding, a cultural understanding of how to talk to tribes and uh, tribal representatives. Because as, as was mentioned, you know, the regulatory side, the field work, like Ethan, Evan was saying, we can teach you that part. The skills in tribal consultation are a much different skill set, and it, it's um, uh, it's very hard to find. Like Hanna was saying, uh, the 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 industry is impacted right now. We need folks sort of at all levels. It's really busy. It's I think probably crazy enough during COVID. It's probably the busiest that I've ever seen it, um, which is great for us. But I think uh, in general. Uh, where I see the industry sort of shifting right now, at least for on our end, is that I'm, I have grown to be much more interested in hiring somebody out with a BA uh, or a BS uh, and, and graduate students, but really high quality, high energy people who are really have really good personal skills um, and training them in all the minutia of the business rather than trying to go find mid-level people with experience because uh, the investments we've made on, on folks at the beginning of their career have just so paid off. And I'd rather, I'd rather m meet young, energetic, smart people who maybe don't have the experience, but have the personality skills to do this kind of work. So uh, <clears throat> if you know, if that's you, I'd love to talk with you later on today. Uh, boy, uh, uh, notes, taking notes. I, I'll tell you, I know project managers will who will instantly think less of you if you are in a meeting with them and you are not taking notes. Psychologically, uh, it is an important skill set to learn because the people you are talking to are watching you and seeing if you are taking notes or not. And if you are not taking notes, they are assuming that you are blowing them off. Um, so 
that's that that's actually its own skill set is learning how to take notes. And I'll tell you, um, I find most often where people fail in this business is not their lack of knowledge about a particular theory or field technique. It's laziness. It's just sheer. I didn't fill out the paperwork because I was too tired or I didn't clean up my mess or I didn't get back to that person when I was supposed to because I uh, you know, got distracted or something like that. It was not paying attention to the work, which is something that we're all capable of doing. Uh, the rest of the stuff can be learned. Um, and the, then I just want to touch on one other thing here, which is the uh, what, what, what Hannah mentioned, which is the disaster work piece. Like I said, I work on climate change since uh, 2012. Um, I'm, I do quite a bit of uh, public speaking on that issue and discussion with our own climate change team on how climate change is going to affect cultural resources. One of the other hats I wear is I'm on the board of directors for the Alta Heritage Foundation. Uh, one of the things that we do, you may have seen this in the news, is we go into uh, catastrophic wire, uh, wildfire zones and after the uh, the houses have burned. We go in and recover the ashes of people who were, whose ashes were stored in the house before the fires. So it's a it's a big uh, it's a, now it's a volunteer effort. If folks are interested in that, I'd be happy to talk with you about that. But uh, we've done hundreds of homes now. This is something we never did four years ago, and now we're doing you know probably 100 homes a year. So um, that's it. I think I'll I'll pass it on to the next person. Uh, thanks, Mike. And uh, I, I should mention that uh, Mike was, has been kind enough on several occasions now uh, to come out to, to my university and talk to my uh, students, including uh, uh, at least one uh, group of uh, women of color who are interested in archaeology um, and wanted to, and were thinking about moving forward with it. I don't think had they not talked to, to Mike that they would have, and several are now um, in grad school. I think some are in attendance. Um, here this very moment. So thank you for doing that. Uh, next is uh, uh, Christina Spellman, and I'm so happy to uh, to introduce her. We actually worked together at Albion uh, for some time, um, and I'll, I'll I'll let you take it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez. Nice to see you again. Um, so I feel like in this this lineup of of people presenting today, I am potentially the the greenest. You know, I, I started archaeology in 2010. I went to field school through the Cabrillo Field Archaeology Program, which is excellent. If you need a field school, I would recommend that. Um, I started working at Albion in 2012 after going to UCSC. Um, I started being involved with mission archaeology at uh, Santa Clara University. And I had these questions in my mind and I wasn't sure how to talk about them. I didn't feel like I had a voice at that moment. And so I decided to go to UMass Boston, a really great historical archeology span program. So I was there um, from 2015 through 2017 doing my coursework. Um, and I still have not finished my thesis yet, but it's um, I should be getting it completed this summer. Um, and from that point, I came back to California and I'm here now. I I am a co-owner of Albion. Um, my perspective is from the field. I prefer not doing office work, although I realize that you need a balance sometimes. But um, so I felt a little underprepared for this conversation. So um, for the, the questions that were kind of proposed um, in preparation for this, it's gonna be a mix of my opinion, but also um, a fellow co-owner, uh, Sarah Pilo. Um, so, our business was incorporated in 1997. Um, it's a woman owned predominantly business um, and we have offices in Santa Cruz and in San Luis Obispo. Uh, we enjoy working closely with clients to provide high quality and cost-effective strategies. Um, obviously I'm reading right now, but ultimately we do everything from consultation, um, mitigation, inventories. Um, you know, We want to highlight as everyone has already presented, integrating Native American voices and from, from the entire process. It's, it's extremely important. That's where my heart is. Um, and I don't feel, well, I've only worked for Albion, honestly. So I don't really know how other companies do it, but I, I honestly feel like it is way under, 
represented in the past, obviously, and it seems like our concern is here now, and I'm really proud to be an archaeologist in, in that realm, and so I hope that the development um, is representing itself to tribal communities in, in a meaningful way. Um, besides that is a, a concern in CRM practice is the early identification of resources in an area before you go into the field. You need to do the research, you know, you need to know the research questions, you need to know what you're looking for. Um, so if you're a student who's curious and in your on a project, it, just do your own research too, or ask the people, you know, that uh, might have the answers and just, you know, have a, a good basis of the, the pre-colonial and historical context of where you are, because it honestly, it makes the job a lot more fun and interesting. Um, considering the new administration's political impacts on your work, that was one of the questions posted. Um, I don't have a response for that in particularly. Um, in my personal politic, I have family in Guam, and I know that there are military bases over there, and there's a lot of archaeology that is conducted there. And even most recently, there have been protests from indigenous people um, not wanting the military development because it's a tiny island. But um, those are the concerns for me. Um, and then potential jobs. So in COVID, everything has slowed down um, dramatically. But as people have said also, because of that, the field schools haven't occurred. And so the, the pool is small. Um, but that being said also, there's not much in the Albion realm of big projects. We usually keep it small. It's a smaller company, like 30 or 40 people between the Santa Cruz and slow offices. Um, but still, we'll take your resumes to so send them on in if you're in the Santa Cruz or slow um, vicinity, or even if you're, you're outside of it and you wanna come in, if we have bigger jobs, we'll definitely pay per diem. Um, but yeah, I'm actually, that's, that's all I have. I, I doubt it's five minutes, but I, again, I'm, I get really nervous when I speak. I know that's not professional, but <laughs> that's, uh, that's all I have. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And you know, uh, I'll be honest, has, uh, has hired, uh, I, I don't even know how many of my students um, at this point have, have gone through um, Albion. So um, for all the students out there, I mean, there, there are jobs to be had. I mean, it's a little, it's a little tough now with the lack of field training, but uh, I'll send more um, in the future. So Christina, thank you for taking them uh, too. I have one, one final thing actually, I, I remembered. Okay, so because we're so small, um, we have a variety of, of specialists here analyzing faunal, ceramics, whatever else. And if you're interested in a particular material culture and you voice that, this is a very important aspect of my experience in Albion is that I was driving over the hill with Sarah Pilo and she's, her specialty is locally produced ceramics. And we're just chatting and I was like, that is of interest to me and she made it happen. So she trained me, she gave me the opportunity. I was able to develop myself in a way that my mind, you know, the questions that I'm asking about archeology span and the ways I, I am understanding these things and how they connect are really, um, they, they came to a coalescence because I, I was brave enough to be like, hey, I'm here and I'm interested, let's do this. And uh, that's what I would encourage people to do. Thank you so much. Uh, Sarah Pilo is my, is my Yoda, my Sierra Yoda um, also. So we share that certainly. Um, uh, next, uh, Mike Taylor, NWB Environmental Services. I just wanna say that uh, I met Mike at uh, Columbia, I don't know how many years ago, uh, now uh, in the lab there. And um, I wanted to, to go to California and I found out that he lived, he lived in California and planned on going back, I think. And I was like, we've got to make, we've got to make stuff happen. So we've been collaborating on various projects uh, now for some time and I'm so happy to, to introduce him. Mike Taylor, please take it away. All right, uh, I'm very happy to be here. I'm stopping, I'm starting my uh, stopwatch just like Michael. Uh, so we can keep this thing moving. Uh, I am the founder and president of uh, uh, NWB Environmental Services, a small uh, CRM firm based in uh, San Diego. Uh, we have satellite offices in the Bay Area as well as uh, Los Angeles. Um, we're a minority owned business. We are a disabled veteran owned business. Um, 
founded in 2012. Uh, before then, I was a field tech for a few years. Um, we, we, we primarily focus on supporting uh, utility firms. We've done work for Southern California Gas. Uh, uh, right now, we, we, we do the bulk of our work uh, is for um, SDG&E and, um, and, and Verizon Wireless, uh, which takes us uh, all across the state of California, uh, Northern and Southern California. And, and we do uh, county and city uh, other clients uh, work like that uh, uh, for service. Um, I, I, I don't have any more comments about the uh, new administration, um, um, perhaps issues in CRM. Uh, it, some of those are were addressed, but uh, one interesting one is uh, uh, for some reason there's 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 little to no black archaeologists uh, <laughs> in the West, and I, and 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 I'm I'm not sure uh, why that phenomenon exists, and it's been that way for a while. Um, but it's just the uh, I don't know. It seems like something worth mentioning, uh, and I don't know I don't know where it starts to kind of interest black folks in studying anthropology and 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 even archaeology. But uh, it's just an interesting phenomenon. I think there's a there's a void of black folks in, in environmental services uh, in general, actually. Um, uh, potential jobs. Um, uh, we, we've actually we've hired a couple of folks out of Albert's um, program there uh, with, with uh, no experience. That's one thing um, I'm sort of really big on is um, not necessarily requiring a, a lot of experience, uh, um, really you know, giving folks opportunities, um, uh, and, and especially um, just by default, uh, being diverse on the top, uh, uh, our staff and the folks we hired are, are really runs the gamut of in terms of diversity. Um, so with diversity at the top, I, you don't need any kind of diversity programs or anything like that to, 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 to for for all folks to, to get opportunities here. Um, we're just starting an on-call with uh, Southern California Gas. And so we would certainly be uh, accepting uh, resumes for, for our field tech on-call uh, uh, roster. Uh, and, 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 and we're always looking for folks in, 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 in Southern California as well. Um, we, I've done, yeah, internships, we, we've done that uh, locally um, from uh, um, uh, local community colleges uh, from their programs. Um, and uh, I, I think um, uh, in terms of, 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 of new hires with little experience, I think, um, I think in archaeology programs, uh, I think it's uh, it's it's great to focus on the, the excavations and, and 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 surveys are important, but I think a, a little bit more emphasis should be put on on, on insights and teaching uh, 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 new up and coming archaeologists about uh, monitoring and being on construction sites, since that is such a huge. There's so much time uh, spent on construction sites, and that's a that's a really big part of what's done in in CRM. Um, but for some reason, it doesn't seem to be, it could be emphasized a little bit more in, in, in programs and in, in, in at uh, community colleges. You know, uh, you know, they shouldn't show up at the door of a CRM, you know, with something as simple as not owning a reflector vest and hard hat, you know. Um, but I think they should re really receive much more insight and on, uh, on monitoring and, and filling out monitoring reports uh, and things like that. And, um, it might seem a little minor, but it's it's kind of major, <laughs> uh, actually. Um, so uh, that's my five minutes, and uh, I'll yield to uh, Dr. Gonzalez. Uh, thank, thanks, Mike. And uh, if if you wouldn't mind, um, I wonder if if you wouldn't mind taking a, a bonus minute to uh, tell us a little bit about your TV show. Um, <laughs> I think I think that people should know, and it's a good opportunity for a plug. Okay, uh, geez, uh, I wasn't expecting that. Uh, I'm, I'm also a, a, a filmmaker and I own a, a film production company, uh, NWB Imaging. 
And uh, one of the shows that we produce uh, which is on KPBS, which is a local PBS station here in San Diego. It's called uh, Theater Corner. And, and I'm actually the host and I, I interview uh, black actors, directors, playwrights, other uh, film uh, professionals. Uh, we just got extended for a second season uh, and we're, we're doing interviews uh, now. Uh, and we had a chance to interview a lot of folks that you, you'll you'll probably recognize like Felicia Rashad and Debbie Allen and Dulé Hill. Um, uh, and so uh, uh, Hal Linden, for those of you that, uh, that are as old as me, I grew up with uh, Barney Miller. You, I, I had a chance to sit down with uh, uh, the real, the actual Barney Miller. So that was pretty exciting. But yes, uh, that's, that's kind of what I, I, I do in my uh, off time is, is, uh, is, is host this particular show which uh, you, you can find on PBS uh, app and website as well. Thanks, thanks Albert. Yeah, in other words, you know, I, I honestly, uh, I'm, I'm not into theater, but I am now having watched your show. I've watched lots of uh, episodes at this point. Um, do, do, do watch it, do tune in. Uh, and finally, um, it's, and I'm not sure if it's pronounced uh, Addy or Adi, um, please, please let me know, Adi. Uh, Adi Whitaker, Far Western. Great, um, thanks. And I'm mean, going to apologize in advance because I've been sitting here listening to everybody for the last hour and my dogs have been silent until right as Michael was finishing up and then they started barking. So <laughs> hopefully they'll still stay quiet. Um, well, thank you so much. And um, I'm going to try to keep it really brief because um, um, I'm at the end of the line here. Uh, and most people have covered everything that I was going to talk about anyway. Um, so. I'm Edie Whitaker. I'm one of the principals of Far Western Anthropological Research Group. Um, we are uh, a CRM firm that is headquartered in Davis, just outside of Sacramento. Um, we're just under 100 employees right now, um, and we have offices in um, our main office in Davis, and then we have an office in Sausalito, um, and two offices in Nevada, one in Carson City and one in Las Vegas, um, or actually Henderson. Uh, and we work for all kinds of different federal and state um, and private clients. Uh, we do a lot of Caltrans work. Uh, we do a lot of PG&E work. Um, we work for Army Corps of Engineers and the Navy. Um, and then we, we also have just kind of various other clients. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that Far Western's always thought was important, and not to say that the other people who have spoken don't feel that way as well, but we really kind of put at the very front of our um, mission is, is that we're, you know, learning about the past through the work that we're doing. And so, um, you know, we try to steer our ourselves towards projects that have um, archaeological interest and um, you know we certainly still do a lot of the, the other stuff that everybody does but that's that's kind of one of our goals and um, we like to stay active in publishing and um, and also in outreach and so we have a big outreach program um, we also have uh, professional staff who do only GIS and we have professional staff who do only production um, and so that is something that, you know, there's a lot of pieces that go into cultural resource management and, um, and we have people who, who spend all their days making, you know, making our work products look really good. Um, and so that's actually another entree into, into CRM is, um, you know, maybe you're not somebody who likes to be in the field all the time, but, uh, you know, it's that there's other ways that people contribute um, to what we do. Um, and I, the, the one thing, actually, there are two things that that no one has covered yet that I just wanted to share um, from my perspective. And so the first one is, is about writing. So um, I really loved what Desiree and what Mike said about, um, you know, communication and note taking and learning how to you know speak to a variety of people um the other thing that like permeates all of what we do is is writing right so if you're in the field and you're recording a site how you describe the site um you can't ever get that back if you don't do it right um and the way that we communicate what we 
um, have found both in you know, the documents that we write that only agencies read and in the documents that we write that the public sees, all of that communication comes through writing. And so um, I think when I see um, you know, myself coming up uh, through CRM and, and um, the people that I've seen over the 15 or so years that I've been doing CRM, who I see kind of grow into new roles in, com in companies are the ones who can write. And so um, for those of you that are you know, looking to get into a career in this, uh, taking a few writing classes can be a really useful you know, I mean, just, I, I think it's under, under um, appreciated kind of how important just being able to put together, um, you know, a well-written email or a well-written uh, memo can be um, just in terms of um, kind of what people think about you. So that was one thing. And then the other thing that I think people haven't really covered, and I should back up and say that Far Western, um, we've, we've got a lot of work going on right now Part of our Navy contract, uh, we happen to have won a bunch of big surveys. So we've got 100,000 acres to survey in Fallon, Nevada. Um, so we're going to be having people walk the desert um, for like three years. So if people want to go out to Nevada, um, send me a CV. We, we are definitely looking for folks to do that. And we have a couple other big projects. Um, but one of the things nobody has really talked about, and I don't know what was clear to me when I was an undergrad and, and thinking I wanted to get at least a job in CRM to see what it was like, is that it's going to be pretty rare that coming out of, out of your undergrad that you're just going to get hired full time for a job. And so that was my expectation. I thought I'll put in an application, I'll get hired, this will be great, I'll have a job, right? Because that's the way you know any other job I had applied for worked. But the way that CRM work often works is that you get hired on on a job by job basis. So you might get hired to go do um, you know, a particular survey and you get hired in chunks of five or 10 days. Um, we end up with people that do a good job. They end up working for us all the time and then eventually get staff archeologist jobs that are full time with benefits and stuff. But it's just good to know that landscape. Um, and maybe we can talk a little bit more about that as, as we kind of go forward. But um, I think I'm gonna leave it at that and hand the floor back over to Dr. Gonzalez. Great. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate your point about writing and about uh, uh, changing the way that that uh, we teach archaeology so that students can be, you know, their careers can more easily, their lives can more easily fit um, expertise, more easily fit into the CRM uh, sort of mold. We've had that problem forever. And uh, I think that's actually a good way to uh, uh, segue into the, the Q&A, uh, if that's okay, because a lot of my questions um, are, are pretty deeply connected to that. Um, thank you all so much uh, for your for your introductions and for the for the valuable information. I'm sure uh, tons of students are out there now and will be uh, watching this in the future um, who are getting answers to questions that they didn't even know uh, that they had. So uh, um, if it's all right, I'll start with uh, with some questions. So I would like to know because I think that uh, as we all know, most anthropology archaeology students don't really have any idea of what an archaeologist does, whether academic or, or, or CRM, um, you, know, you know, every day, what their everyday life is like, and just kind of imagine it um, as a life purely in the field. And we all know that's untrue, but for some archaeologists, it's more true than others. And I'm curious what your, what your daily life is like, you know, your nine to five or, or whatever, you know. Um, so what is a typical day in your life as a CRM archaeologist uh, like for those of you who'd, who'd uh, like to answer the question. And we can start with Hannah or with anyone sort of uh, who feels compelled to, to raise their hand and answer. Sure, I'd be happy to start. Um, well, it's a little different now that I'm working from home nonstop, <laughs> but, but the, well, the, the location I'm working is different. Um, what I do, I do a lot of project management um, which means that I am interacting with clients, I am tracking budgets, I am um, dealing with and, and helping people who are working on my projects to move parts of that forward, whether it's getting field work arranged or uh, processing the, the information that we got from being in the field and translating that into reporting. Um, I do a lot of report editing um, and, um, and now I'm also doing more sort of corporate things too <laughs> in my new role, but, um, but I don't go into the field much. And um, it, in fact, it's, it's a fairly rare thing for me these days and has been for a while. 
Uh, but I spent a lot of time early in my career doing field work um, which provide, and lab work, which provided the really good basis for the work that I'm doing now so that I can help the people who work with me on these projects. Um, so it's a lot of looking at a computer, answering emails, some talking on the phone, lots of Zoom calls <laughs> um, and meetings. Um, but one of the things that I really like about cultural resources management is that um, there's so many areas for growth. And, and even though I may be working on, you know, doing similar things on different projects, the content of those projects is really different. Um, and so it's not boring and I'm always learning. And so I think that that's a really wonderful thing about this business. Thank you, uh, uh, Mike. I see your hand up, Mike Taylor. Uh, I'd like to comment really quickly on uh, perhaps uh, what it looks like for uh, uh, CRM field tech day-to-day uh, -day, um, and kind of talk about a couple of my experiences. Um, I, I was that field tech that you, you just tell me where I need to go and I'll go and I'll be there. I'll take any, any project. And I think that uh, sort of made me rather successful and I, and I worked consistently um, and I just did a good job. And so, um, and, and that fed into my reputation. And so that's a, another good point. The, your, your reputation is, is huge. Uh, um, CRM is a relatively small community. And so just, just pay attention to your, your reputation because uh, it's, 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 it has almost everything to do with whether you're working or not working. I've been on uh, one really long project. Um, it was an Edison project, uh, building a transmission line. And so I, I lived uh, out of a hotel in Palm Desert for 14 months straight. And all I did for 14 months was monitor uh, const construction. And 14 months, not one artifact popped up. And so, just understand that, um, but the, what I was doing was still very important, and, you know, as part of the whole compliance. But this this is an example of you know the 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 the, the kind of work uh, kind of situation you may find yourself in. So it's 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 uh, perhaps you should think about okay, well, how does that affect if I'm married and I got to go out of town like that? You know, this is in Palm Desert. I live in San Diego. So what, what does that actually look like? You know, uh, living in a hotel for five, six days out of a week and working extremely long hours during each day. This, this is 10 to 12 hour, hour days. And in being in the elements, you know, this, this was desert work. Uh, being in the elements during the, the summer and winter of the desert. And so these are a lot of things to consider to think about whether being a field tech is actually for you, you know, to think about it's, this is, this is the non romanticized version of an archeologist. And so just, uh, just kind of think about and think through it that way. That's all just kind of really take a realistic look uh, at what, what it means to be a field tech. Hi, no. Christina, oh, Christina. Yeah. Or, I don't was there someone else who is going to speak right now? I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead, Christina. Okay. Um, to add on to, to your words, um, I prefer field work. I'm not out of town all that much. I'm fortunate enough to just commute from my home. But I was, um, I want to highlight having to be adaptable and not knowing exactly where you might have to be, the conditions you're going to work in, the hotel you're staying in, the people you might have to meet, um, being on a construction site is stressful if you haven't been there before. Um, again, highlighting the fact that you need all the protection gear. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think from a field perspective, I, I enjoy it because I love being outside. It's a different sort of stress than if you're in the office day in and day out. Um, so it, it depends on how you want to navigate where your career goes, you know, and, and again, voice where you want to be and, and create those opportunities for yourself. That's all. Thank you. I see uh, uh, Desiree, uh, Blue Hand, Desiree, and then Mike Newland. I think we were on the same project, Michael. I, I was out in the Mojave for four months living out of a hotel. Um, and I'm glad you brought up about, you know, sometimes you don't find anything. Um, 
when I, and I was actually working for Cogstone at the time, and we had another individual who they brought out from another state, and he was disappointed that we weren't finding everything every something every day. And the material culture um, from the state that he was from was very different from what you find in the desert in California. And he was like so disappointed and so mad and frustrated and stuff like that. And I said, I am so happy that I'm not finding a single thing because that means the ancestors and their items are not being impacted. That's why I'm there. Um, so you really have to have a really good mindset and not to tell you guys to not be archaeologists, but please don't become an archaeologist if you only want to find cool things because that's not the point. The point is to make sure, and, and it's more especially for me, not necessarily the people out in the desert were my ancestors, but they're still the ancestors and their history and their items deserve to be protected. And if you're not gonna do your due diligence to be um, you know, off your phone, making sure you're looking at the ground to look for that stuff, then you, this is not the job for you because you're out there, you're the last hope for the, for the native people and for the ancestors and, and of course, I'm just focusing on, on, on native stuff, but also all people's stuff. You're the last line of defense to make sure that things aren't being impacted. And if you don't have that heart and that determination and that work through it all to be out there for 10 hours a day and to be attentive, of course, making sure you don't get run over by the tractors or whatever. But if you're not there um, to do those things, then please do something else. Thank you, Desiree. And uh, Mike Newland? Yeah, you know, so a lot of the folks that are on this panel, like like Hannah and, and Desiree and Mike and myself, I mean, most of us are staff or senior staff people within our organizations. I mean, I spend most of my, honestly, I spend almost all of my day in meetings, uh, and particularly tribal consultation meetings. They're very complicated. Um, they're very, uh, very intense. Uh, as an archaeologist coming out of school, I never thought I would be doing this, and uh, but it's work that I love. Um, if I can make a recommendation, <clears throat> when I started this, when I started this business, I won't tell you how long ago, but it was a long time ago. Um, I didn't find out about CRM until I was a senior at UC Davis, and it was taught to me by graduate students, never mentioned by professors. That's changed. I think I see a lot more engagement from professors and teaching students about this. But I really want to I want really want to emphasize the importance in graduate students in teaching you the next step of your career, both in how to get into grad school um, classes, but also how to outreach to companies because a lot of the graduate students when they those guys cut you know those men and women cut their teeth doing culture resource work. And in some ways, they're they're as good or better at telling you how to um, navigate those first few years out of college so than some of us old timers who haven't had to do it for a while. And the same goes for the professors who also have not been out there uh, doing it for a while. And, and no slight to them. It's just, you know, we're established in our careers. And uh, I want to I want to highlight what Mike said about uh, reputation. Um, you know, this game, it, it, CRM is about uh, competing against your friends and, and playing with, with your competitors. Uh, you know, we team with a lot of people that are on here. Um, I'm teaming with some of these folks right now. And I really like all these folks. And, and next week, we're going to be competing against each other on another project. You cannot ever afford to burn a bridge here because you never know where that person is going to be. You, you slight somebody now as a tech, they're going to be a PI in a firm in 10 years. Uh, uh, don't ever burn a bridge. Um, it's just, uh, Mike said, like Mike says, your reputation is, is worth everything. And it's how you network to get jobs. If you get a good reputation, people will look out for you and help you get work. Thank you. I think that's a, that's a great way. Unless, unless, uh, uh, AD has something to add. I think it's a great way to work ourselves into to the second uh, question. Um, so, so considering the the usual constitution of anthropology undergraduate degrees, and I know in the CRM world there are a lot of complaints um, about this, and we've heard you know, you all allude to some of them. Um, how should California undergraduate students uh, prepare for a job in CRM? And I know that some of these things have been mentioned already, but I'm especially concerned for how 
low-income students might uh, best prepare, uh, who aren't able to sort of go off at a moment's notice necessarily for a project that will only last, say, you know, three weeks. Um, so how, how do you recommend that they, uh, you know, for, for a field school, you know, or something, um, that they prepare uh, for a job in CRM? And uh, again, unless there's someone compelled to answer, I'll start with Henna and Mike, <laughs> Mike Taylor. Oh, I could say really quickly that for one thing, I, I, I wouldn't wait till like you're a senior to start pursuing archeological work as a field tech. Uh, I, I was still in community college and, 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 and when I had some of the very basic courses down, I, I started uh, working professionally as a, as a field tech. Um, uh, that's that's one that's the first thing that kind of come to my mind and and you know ha and having a linkedin account set up and joining perhaps some archaeology groups within uh, linkedin uh so so certainly don't don't put it off thinking that because you don't have a degree that you may not necessarily have any opportunity out there to, to work um uh as as far as i don't know i i was a I don't know any students that are that aren't low income. Uh, <laughs> uh, that part of the question, uh, you know, um, you know, I, I, we have our field techs that don't have vehicles, but we they, we have company vehicles. So maybe you know, as long as you can get to the office, you know, I mean, I think there's I think there's ways of of still working if if you're low income. That's all. Thanks. I think next is uh, Desiree, and then uh, Amy. It'd be nice if I unmuted myself. Um, I actually am a, came from a lone income, first generation um, family background. And I actually did my first um, archeological field school in high school. And that was thanks to the TRIO programs, which is a federal uh, program that funds a number of different um, programs for first generation, um, as well as low income students. And this happened to be through Upward Bound. I also um, did another field school when I was an undergrad, and that was through the Mellon Minority Fellowship Program. So there are a number of different um, grants that you can apply to in order to um, get that field experience. Because what's what, what's really important is not only paying for the tuition to go to a field school, but also paying yourself to live, right? Because um, when I was in school, like I had to, because my family didn't give me any money, I had to make sure all money that I, um, um, got through my work study jobs, fed myself, but then also save that money for um, buying my books, buying my airplane ticket back and forth from Philly back to California, et cetera. Um, so the Society for American Archaeology has a number of different scholarships that you can do to get archaeological training. I was chair for a number of years with the Native American Scholarships Committee, and that's specifically for Indigenous peoples of the Americas. Then there's now what's called the HUGS or the, um, the grants that are for underrepresented minorities um, groups. And um, I believe the deadline is actually still there. And so that money is specifically geared for you to do, get um, archeological experience um, to pay for those field schools and or pay for lectures, for instance, um, section 106 training or anything like that, as long as you can show that you're gonna be um, gaining some type of knowledge that's gonna be useful for you in, in an archeological career and or uh, in for native people that are not archeologists, um, information to help them protect their cultural resources. Um, the other big thing too, is if you happen to be at a school that has a graduate program, some graduate students get NSFs and then they have to go and do some digging. And so you can you know, volunteer with that graduate student to help them dig their site. Um, I know there's some trajectory of some um, graduate students are now really more focused on kind of museum collections, but if they've gotten their own grant, they might have some money that's available for you to get that education. Um, I know that when we were running the Pimu Catalina Ion Archaeology School, we always set aside some money um, from the tuition of all of the other students that were paying, Shh, don't tell them, so that we could discount the tuition for people that couldn't afford it. So we actually funded a Native American person for our five-week field school, so that um, you know he only needed to pay fifteen hundred as opposed to the four thousand um, dollars that was necessary. So you know, um, you know, uh, using talking to your advisor or the department chair if you're an undergrad, or talking to the professors and see who they can reach out to 
on your behalf to see to get you that field experience is great. Um, I know that Cogstone does internships with Cal State Long Beach, um, and we were doing that with the NAGPRA coordinator. So we were having the students come every week to Cogstone to learn um, museum curation standards, and at the same time helping um, California State, uh, Cal State Long Beach to get into compliance with their NAGPRA. So that also included um, going through all the soil samples to make sure that they're um, sorted through so that we can identify any ancestral remains or other items that would fall under NAGPRA. So there, there are ways that you can get that experience. I also, um, when I was a first year graduate student, student got a, um, was an intern at Crow Canyon and they paid me to learn about um, you know, the archaeology out there. I was a lab intern, so I learned a whole bunch of lab methods up there. So there's internships that are paid and unpaid that you can you can look into. There's a whole bunch of different grants. Um, I know I applied for a whole bunch of different grants to 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 gain that that experience. So it's it if you want to do it, it's out there, but it does take a lot of time to identify all of that stuff. Thank you so much for that. You know, it's uh, uh, I feel like you're a clearinghouse of uh, of these uh, these opportunities. You know, my students, uh, you know, they ask me pretty often how it is that they can how in the world they could possibly, you know, pay thousands to do, you know, four week or four week plus field school in the summer when they can't possibly afford to take that much time off, even if, you know, I mean, and much less to pay to take that kind of time off in addition, right? Um, so fa fantastic ideas. Thank you. I think next is uh, uh, Adi and then uh, Evan. Um, I wanted to pivot a little bit off of what Mike was saying and put the, the positive spin on, you know, Mike saying don't, uh, don't make any, you know, don't burn any bridges because we're such a small community. I think the positive side of that is um, for students that we are such a small community that I think professors at CSUs and UCs in California and a lot of the community colleges have, you know, went to school with people who are running CRM firms and, um, you know, know, know people in the community. And so, um, you know, I think when I'm hiring techs or at any level, recommendations are the number one um, deciding factor. And so I think, you know, students who are on this call shouldn't be afraid to leverage, you know, if Dr. Gonzalez is, is your professor at um, Cal State East Bay, you know, say, hey, I wanna go find a CRM job, who do you know? And, um, and you know, leverage those, those relationships. Um, and then, uh, the other thing I, you know, and, and it actually was the same forum two years ago, I think Dr. Gonzalez, you were in the audience and you, you asked, well, what the same question, right? And I think it, um, you know, there, it, it led, it was kind of an epiphany for me, it should have been an epiphany much earlier, but um, I mean, I should have had that epiphany much earlier, but um, I think I ended up hiring one of your students and, and it, it was probably somebody that I wouldn't have considered the fact that they didn't have a field school, except that I think my advice then was, well, don't be afraid to tell, you know, tell someone who's hiring you, yes, I realize I don't have a field school, but it's because my circumstances didn't allow me to, you know, spend a summer doing a field school. And I think that that's, um, which probably gets us into the kind of the, the next, you know, the next set of questions about internships and diverse workplaces, but I think diversity includes socioeconomic diversity too. And so um, I think we're all interested in enhancing that. So don't be afraid to just talk to people about it. Thank you for that. Thank you for hiring that student. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think uh, Evan was uh, was up next, Evan. Yeah, um, I, you know, I think there's a lot of, you know, a lot of ways to come into this. Um, and, you know, all these jobs, you know, almost every job posting is gonna say, uh, you know, field, you know, field school required. Um, but those aren't like laws, right? You know, so you can you can try to sell yourself otherwise. You know, you can say, hey, I haven't had a, I haven't had a field school, but you know, I've done these things. Hey, you know, we've we hire, we you know sometimes after big um, field projects we've got just tons of lab work so you know some, like I you know when I was at the um, when I was at Berkeley I volunteered 
uh, internships with grad students and with you know, a variety of professors doing lab work in the basement of the art. I mean, it's right below you um, there. And you know, that's, you can say, oh, hey, you know, I did, you know, I did uh, pollen analysis with, um, you know, uh, uh, with Celeste or, um, you know, all these sort of things are, are ways in. And the, I mean, one of the big things about the field school is, you know, it's a rite of passage, obviously, and it's, you know, it does, it does, it does give you skills, um, but it's also just kind of a way of us being able to be like, we can trust you. You're not like, you know, to be a looter, right? So there's an element to teaching things and teaching how we want things done. I, I say, I would say, you know, like, um, uh, like Michael said earlier, you know, don't wait until you're, you know, you've graduated. You know, you can start talking to uh, people in CRM, just saying, you know, hey, I'm available two days a week. If you got things, you know, you can uh, you can have me do. These are the skills I have. Um, and the you know the other thing is that you know, other people touched on a variety of of, uh, of scholarships and things. I mean, I think those are you know those are super useful. Um, You know, especially if you do a if you if you do a field school that's in California, it's just a, a lot of community colleges have a, have field methods classes, and you know those can kind of substitute. And you know maybe you're doing two days a week for a semester instead of uh, you know four days four weeks in a summer or something. And you know other good other good ways of um, of getting those sort of skills. And then I think the last thing I would say is really take advantage of of student um, of student rates at uh, the various archaeological uh, associations, Society for American Archaeology, Society for California Archaeology, and the reduce and then the volunteer opportunities to staff those meetings for free. And going and doing those, I mean, you get great information. You get you see what people are doing, and don't hesitate to go up to people who you might think are unapproachable. Every single archaeologist has, was where you are, right? So, you know, someone might seem like they're a giant in the field or, um, you know, unapproachable and just go up and talk to them and, uh, you know, see how that goes. And, you know, the worst thing that happens is that they're addicted to you. And if they're addicted to you, you don't want to work with them anyways. Well, well thank you. I, I'm seeing double. So I see you have two, uh, uh, two uh, uh, manifestations here. You've, you've kind of become a partable person. Whichever one you're on now, stay on that one because we can hear you on that one. Uh, the other one uh, seems to break up, uh, Evan, just an FYI, uh, quite a bit. Uh, let me, I'll move. Oh, sorry, Mike, I see you. Mike Newland. Yeah, there you go. Sorry about that. Uh, just a couple quick things. Um, <clears throat> one, uh, and we're, I know we're going to come back to it, but I, you know, internships are a pretty remarkable way to get your career started. Because when you're done, done with the internship, you're a known quantity to that organization. They have vetted you for a semester. And you know more about that company uh, and how it works than anybody else applying to that job. And it's a great way. It puts you at advantage, even with people with more experience than you. So I know we'll talk about that later, but I want to put that out there. A couple other quick things. Um, the uh, Society for American Archaeology uh, and the Archaeological Institute of America every year puts out the Fieldwork Opportunity Bulletin it actually usually comes out roughly this time of year. It's actually how I got started. And it has everything under the sun all over the planet. A lot of field schools, sometimes some paid gigs, and a lot of times some volunteer gigs. And that's actually how I started was a two-week volunteer out in the Arizona desert. I just had to get there. And they put me up. And I just had to have money for food. And so... Be, you know, I would be a little creative uh, and don't limit yourself to a traditional field school. There are other volunteer uh, opportunities that can help fill that in. Um, there is one thing I wanted to, to touch on. And again, I think we'll talk more about it at the internship is, uh, is the issue with, with lower income students. I, I'm going to turn that around and say, I think that the industry has an obligation to change that for decades, this has been a field that you would only get a full-time job if you had a graduate degree. And that self-limits to people who have funding 
to get graduate degrees. And not only that, who have the uh, financial confidence that they could get a graduate degree in anthropology or archaeology and not s s another traditional, you know, very, you know, money making career oriented field. And I, you know, if I was going to uh, opine, I would say that is frankly why we have such a white field uh, is because uh, we have self selected for a certain small cross section of the population that felt like they could afford to do this. And it's really incumbent upon us to, you know, everybody on this panel to break that and to work with folks coming out with an undergraduate program and give them full time jobs to reach out to underrepresented communities um, to find ways for uh, folks to get transportation to projects, be flexible with schedules, be flexible with field working hours. We have a lot of work, we have a lot of homework to do, I think, to fix that. And that's on us. And that shouldn't be on the students to fix that. So I, I love the way you put that, Mike. Thank you so much. And I think that's a perfect segue into um, a question about internships. You know, what I think I'll do is put together a couple of the questions uh, that I sent out to you because um, one of the things I was going to ask is if your firm has any uh, internships to offer, if you know any, any that do. Um, but I think that's more of a yes or no, that can be a yes or no, and something that you talk a little bit more about in the breakout groups. In, in the interest of time then, why don't, we, why don't I ask, does your firm offer uh, any internships or entry level positions with, for students with little or no experience? Uh, and then uh, um, uh, also, what are the greatest obstacles from your end to creating internships? And I'll tell you why I ask, because um, you know, in my efforts in NorCal and in uh, New Mexico to uh, uh, produce, to, to, to co-produce archaeology internships with my museum, um, you know, front some of the, the, the hourly uh, pay for it. It's still hard, even, even when my museum says, we are willing to pay an hourly wage for this student to, to work with you part of the time because of overhead costs, insurance, and things like that. Um, and I wonder from your end what the biggest obstacles are to creating um, internships, whether it's overhead insurance or internal resistance or whatever, and also if you, if you have them. So um, I don't see any uh, little uh, virtual hands. Oh, I see a couple of, uh, Mike, why don't, why don't you go ahead with what you're saying, and then we'll move to Mike right. Taylor. Yeah, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna roll right in there. So we uh, just this past year have created a uh, um, a diversity, equality, and inclusion internship firm wide within our organization. All of our practices have reached out and uh, to different uh, universities and colleges. We have uh, interns starting this year. It's a paid internship. Uh, I think it's like twenty bucks an hour. We set you up with computers, uh, equipment, everything. Um, there's uh, essentially a curriculum that comes with it. There's networking. Uh, this year, particularly, I mean, let's be honest, the last four years of the past administration were miserable. Uh, but it brought so many issues, particularly around um, diversity and uh, inclusion that, uh, that we just had not been addressing. And so our company is actually working with a, a consulting firm to help us fix some of that. And so we have we have an internship now in archaeology, specifically re reaching out to underrepresented communities to help fix some of that. And we, that's going to be every year, every semester. I'm I'm glad to hear that it's gonna that it's gonna keep coming through because I got your your message on that. I thought, wow, this is fantastic, and I sent it out to my students, and and the response right now because I was like, well. You know, I don't have any, I don't have any field experience right now. Doesn't just, matter. No, no experience. <laughs> yeah, no okay. experience. Cool. All yeah. right, good to hear you hear that, students. All right, your yeah, no experience. I, the, the, the idea is to is to teach you and help you start your career. Great. It's it's not. I'm not looking for, you know, the the most experienced person. I'm looking for somebody that's got fire in the belly and who's smart and who wants to take charge of their future. Thank you. So, uh, Mike Taylor, and then uh, uh, Christina Spellman. Okay, I'll, I'll be really quick. And, and we've done uh, interns, not a formal intern program, but just uh, when, you know, uh, interacting with the professors at the local community colleges have recognized some uh, couple of the students that are, you know, that are that are really enthusiastic and motivated. And uh, I, I absolutely do not entertain having interns with no pay. So basically, we, we put them on payroll. Um, and they, they shadow some of the experience field techs uh, out in the field or on monitoring. 
um, if they, you know, able to grow legs, then they actually get to the opportunity to monitor on their own as well. And then they're just field tech by, by name, but basically they're, they're, they're interns by name, but they're, they're basically field techs. And so, uh, like Mike says, it's, it's, it's all about uh, getting the individual the, the, the experience that, that they wouldn't otherwise have. And, and I want to comment on what was talked about earlier about uh, field schools. Um, I, I never attended a field school. I, I started working when I was in community college and just established the experience, uh, established the resume, and that spoke for me uh, going forward after that. So, you know, if I, if I get two people apply, uh, applying for a field tech position, and one is uh, just have field school in Belize, and the other one has had some monitoring experience in California. That one, the, that California experience as a field tech, uh, even if it's only uh, if they only monitored one week, that, that that looks more appealing to me than some uh, field school in an exotic place. Um, so I, I wouldn't be concerned uh, if it was a student that, that, you know, if you can't get a grant or a scholarship for a field school. Uh, I don't uh, think it's uh, it's not a, it's not there's no chance for you because you don't have a field school. That's all. Thank you, Mike. I think we'll go to, to Christina and then Evan and uh, and then I think uh, uh, Sarah. Let me know what you think. I think it's probably a good time uh, to break out after that. So, um, Christina, please go ahead. Okay. Um, I just wanted to mention keep your eyes open for opportunities because. For myself and my thesis work, um, I was able to recruit some um, students from UCSC and they were interns and their internship counted as a course at UCSC. Um, they had to do the footwork of contacting the professor, um, but it was legit. And it makes a good connection between academia and the CRM world. And they're learning on the ground what CRM work looks like. It was an analysis-based sort of project. They're, basically sorting through a bunch of rocks, looking for locally produced ceramics from the mission. Um, and they had to write a paper in the end, but there are various um, internships out there. Just keep your eyes open. Um, that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, Evan? Um, yeah, you know, so we are, Paley West is in the process currently of, of establishing a internship um, program specifically. Um, but that doesn't mean that we, we don't do it uh, otherwise. Um, you know, I, to speak generally to the field, and, and this is not so much a problem at Paleo West, but in other places that I've worked in the past, you know, part of the, part of the um, difficulty with internships is that, you know, you either, need to, you either need to pay somebody or you have to give them work that could not be filled by a paid person. You know, it has to be like really just their, their benefit only, right? Um, you can't like replace another worker. And so in past companies, that's been the big hurdle that I've run into. Um, you know, we're not, um, you know, we're not operating that way. So like Mike, um, you know, we, we pay. Um, and, you know, really, I think the, the thing with us is, you know, trying to find the appropriate amount of time and project work uh, to ensure that the internship is fruitful for, for both us and, um, and the students. Um, yeah, we just wanna make sure that it's, it's you know, beneficial to, uh, to everybody. And you know, I think a lot of these things will be a bit easier as we get back into more you know, office work. Um, you know, it's a little harder to mentor uh, digitally. I mean, I've found that even with our, even with our, you know, paid staff. Um, you know, the other thing is, um, you know, at least one person on this call has, you know, worked part time for us, um, you know, and that's, you know, especially when it comes to, you know, little office things, uh, you know, bits of writing, bits of research, uh, you know, lab work. Um, those are, those are things that, that we can, you know, kind of give you internship credit if you want it, or just kind of hire you as a, as a part-time person um, and, uh, you know, get you as many hours as you can do, and as many hours as, as we have. Um, really the only time that part-time becomes a big issue is when it's, uh, uh, when it comes to field work, um, obviously. 
Well, well, thank you so much, and and thanks to all of you for uh, for for tuning in uh, today uh, with our fantastic uh, uh, panel. I think we're we're ready to go to uh, to breakout groups. For those of you who'd like to uh, stay behind and do our emulation of the typical cookies in the foyer um, piece. Uh, again, uh, um, every uh, panelist will have their own breakout room, so please feel free um, to join them. Um, and uh, I think I might pop about uh, there too.